Alex and, and JC for uh, this very uh, kind invitation. Um, in these sort of trying times, it's, it's a, this is, is, I guess, one of the silver linings that you know, um, we, we can uh, give seminars um, or webinars uh, you know, to, to a, an audience and reach people we normally sort of can't. So I, I very much appreciate uh, this opportunity. So I, I, I take it, I'm sharing my screen so everybody can, can see the slide. Uh, as you can see, the, the title of the talk is Delegation and Ambiguity in Correlated Equilibrium. Uh, you know, joint work, very much joint work with myself and my colleague, um, Ron, whom I can't see in the list of participants, but I, I presume is, is going to be, if he hasn't already, will be doing so soon. Um, and we, which will actually, I think, um, be useful because uh, some of the questions that might be raised or issues uh, the, the co-authors may not be in agreement completely about sort of how that should be handled. So um, I leave it open to Ron to be able to, um, to defend his, his position if he feels I've misrepresented him. Uh, let me um, start by uh, giving sort of a, a, an example of, of where we think uh, the type of equilibrium concept or the, um, the mechanism we're, we're proposing might have um, uh, might be particularly apt um, to apply. And um, you know, you know, for the better part of, of a decade, maybe, maybe even sort of um, longer, you know, we've been talking about sort of the promise of autonomous vehicles and the advantages they might um, provide in alleviating sort of traffic, um, reducing accidents, but, um, and also um, you know, increasing uh, throughput, you know, not just for um, uh, passengers, but, but, but also for freight and everything else on our infrastructure, on our roads. And indeed, I'm, I just still remember um, just being blown away when my, my, my son, who was um, less than 10 at the time, was watching, a, I think it was a, a special on National Geographic, and they were, uh, had this um, mine where everything was being operated by these self-driving vehicles. And uh, to me, it actually seemed like sort of science fiction, the promise of science fiction actually coming to, to fruition. Um, and as I've sort of already um, uh, um, hinted, you know, one of the, you know, the benefits that this is supposed to provide is an ability for us to be able to utilize the road so much more efficiently because if we have all these um, autonomous cars driving, communicating with each other, they can, uh, unlike uh, sort of humans, uh, drive much closer together um, uh, you know, um, through, through sort of coordination. And yet, when you sort of look at um, uh, artistic, uh, artists rendering um, of what a, a self-driving autonomous vehicle be, would be look like, looking like, you know, uh, invariably, there is still the steering column and the steering wheel. Uh, in other talks I've given, people sort of said, yes, but look at the woman, uh, the steering wheel provides such a convenient um, uh, rest for, for her magazine, which, which is obviously true, but, uh, I would su suggest that in order for these to be acceptable um, to humans, for us to be giving up that authority and allowing our machines to be making the or, um, intellig artificial intelligence uh, systems to be making all these decisions on our behalf, you know, we want to have some ability or, or some uh, thought that we can actually um, retain or reassume control if, if, um, if need be. So that's what I think is, is a lead into what we're going to be looking at. And that's this idea of uh, correlated equilibrium, whereby um, where we delegate to uh, the mechanism um, in our strategic interaction that it's going to be um, making the action choices on my, our, our behalf. That is, um, I as a player and all the other players in that game. And so, the big advantage, as I said, for the artificial intelligence system is it can coordinate that behavior of self-driving cars perhaps much more effectively, much more efficiently than can be done, you know, um, individuals acting independently. But, you know, we still want to have this option that drivers, um, either from a psychological point of view or, you know, um, from a view that uh, perhaps unusual things happen. And so we want to have that residual right to take control of the vehicles um, if we see so fit. But the, 
uh, this delegated correlated equilibrium, with, which I'm going to um, uh, develop here in this talk um, over the next hour, is one where the driver will actually never have a strict incentive to do so. So I've been talking about sort of self-driving, so let, let's really try and make things even more concrete by a specific example uh, adapted um, from uh, Alman's um, uh, paper you know, where he introduced the notion of a correlated equilibrium. But rather than just put up a uh, payoff matrix, let's give it a little bit of color. And let's imagine there are two drivers approaching a narrow bridge from opposite sides. And each, as they approach that bridge, perhaps is aware that the other one is coming. And so now faces a choice between, I'm gonna call it action D, driving defensively, and action E, driving egotistically. I guess I could have called it A, or we could have called it A, driving aggressively, but we didn't want to overload our notation since A is a generic action. So uh, when you see E, translate that as the person acting selfishly, egotistically. So <clears throat> what's the um, strategic situation? Um, if they both drive defensively, then they proceed in an orderly manner across the bridge um, and in a timely way get, get across. Um, if they both, if one drives defensively and the other drives egotistically, then the egotist gets their way. Uh, the pro defensive driver has to wait until um, the egotist is, uh, has driven across. And so the egotist gets there a little bit faster uh, and imposing uh, a substantial cost on the defensive driver. Uh, it's symmetric. And then the last payoff is if, if both drive egotistically, um, bad things may happen. So think of this as, a, as an expected payoff, chance of, chance of a really bad outcome, but also um, uh, increase, so increased risks. So you know, for this audience, I, I don't think it's, um, I need to sort of spend too much time for you to see that there are uh, two Nash equilibrium in pure strategies, um, one driving egotistically and the other driving defensively. So if, a, if I think the other driver is driving defensively, then egotistically is better for me, seven is bigger than six. And alas, if I think they're driving egotistically, then <clears throat> I may only get a payoff of two, but it's better than getting a payoff of zero. And of course, there's a mixed strategy um, equilibrium where each is mixing two thirds, one third, which is just the mix needed so that either driver is um, indifferent between which of their um, actions they choose. Uh, unlike sort of the battle of the sexes though, the, the mixed strategy is not that disastrous. You know, it's, it yields a payoff of four and two thirds, which is actually higher than the average payoff for the two symmetric uh, pure strategy Nash equilibria. So even though the mixed strategy Nash equilibria is putting weight on this very bad cell, <coughs> you know, the benefits of, of actually both, both driving are, su are, are such that um, uh, by both driving defensively as such that uh, it, it does better on average or in a utilitarian pure social planner. Okay, so we can sort of see, Alman sort of, I guess, introduced this as a way of sort of saying what we would like is a lot of weight on here and basically no weight on that, but we can't do that if players are choosing independently, whether in pure strategies or, or um, randomizing. So, you know, he introduced the idea of well, what about a correlated equilibrium where the mechanism um, just uh, is, you can think of it as um, in its canonical form, uh, the mechanism is, is going to be um, inducing a randomization over those four cells with zero weight here and just informs each driver about which action they should be taking and given when they update their beliefs, given the prior probability distribution over those four cells, uh, it's um, in their interest to actually follow that recommendation. That's a correlated equilibrium. One that, uh, that I'm, I, I'm ashamed to admit I had not um, come across, even though I was a colleague with um, Hervé for uh, the better part of a decade, is the coarse correlated equilibrium of Moulin and Vial. And that's uh, one where the mechanism uh, has a prior distribution over the action profiles, um, but, the, but 
there's just a null signal or there is, um, the, the players are not given a signal. So all they can do is either uh, follow uh, or choose to allow the mechanism just to choose the action profile or they can unilaterally just deviate and choose their, their, their best, best action or best mixture of action. So what do we do in this paper? We're going to be allowing arbitrary signal spaces and <clears throat> and I guess this is why uh, Ron was happy to, to bring me in on the project. We're also gonna look at ambiguous correlation devices and take it into account that uh, people will have uh, non-neutral attitudes towards ambiguity. Uh, to keep things, um, I guess, sort of tractable and perhaps uh, allowing or affording us the, the um, starkest results, we're gonna take what is probably the most common of the applied models of ambiguity aversion, and that's the so-called Max-Min model. You can think of that as uh, ambiguity of the paranoid, whereby if there's ambiguity there, whenever you evaluate any action or choice you're making, you do so with evaluating it with the expectation with respect to the least favorable. Um, and again, I'm, I'm trusting this audience is familiar with that, but um, if not, hopefully that will become more apparent as we go through uh, the actual um, notation and, um, uh, and expressions. But um, I, I guess, you know, particularly since people have other calls in their time, and I, um, I understand that uh, the UNSW people have a, have a meeting they have to attend, let me get the main results out so that you see them. And what we um, establish is for correlation devices without ambiguity, uh, theorem one is, a distribution over action profiles can be implemented through a delegated correlated equilibrium if and actually only if it constitutes a coarse correlated equilibrium. So remember the coarse correlated equilibrium was that <coughs> extension of um, Alman's original correlated equilibrium by um, Mulan and um, Vial. Uh, there it's just a distribution over the action profiles and the player just has um, the choice of whether you just allow that distribution be implemented according to that um, uh, gen uh, data generating um, process, or you just uh, choose independently. And so we're going to say allowing more elaborate um, signal devices, uh, signal spaces actually adds adds nothing out additional that can be can be implemented um, if there is no ambiguity in our delegated correlating um, device. But once we introduce ambiguity, and again, the, the auxiliary assumption that people are max min with respect to the ambiguity they perceive there to be, theorem two is, as I said, a fairly sort of stark, sharp result, is that any action distribution that Pareto dominates a, co um, a coarse correlated um, equilibrium can actually be approximately implemented through a delegated correlated equilibrium with, um, with, with uh, um, ambiguous correlation. And we'll be more precise about what we mean by approximate uh, implementation as we go through. So let me then, first of all, now sort of set up the, the model. I, I know this is actually, you know, um, you, you've all patiently sat through my, mo my, my motivation and, um, and now you're gonna sort of say, okay, Simon, do you? Tell us what you actually do. So let's just fix um, a game uh, in strategic or normal form. So it just consists of the players, so who's involved, what actions they have available to them, and their payoffs, which as usual is, is just assigning a number to each action profile for each player. Okay, what's our um, ambiguous correlation device? It's going to be... Um, a basically arbitrary finite set of signals or signal realization for each player. So S will just be the product space of um, signals or the, um, or the space of um, signal profiles. And then there's gonna be the correlation device that it has ambiguity. And by that, we mean we can have a set of probability distributions over the products of action profiles and signal profiles. Of course, it's an, if it's an unambiguous correlation device, this set 
the set Q is just a single thing. Okay, so how does it work? So uh, we've got this set Q, this um, uh, ambiguous correlation device. And as I said, it just comprises a set of these distributions. And so one of them is then selected by the device in a way that uh, players have no knowledge about how that is done in a probabilistic way. So they don't have a prior belief or anything. You can think of it being done by you know, some type of the Ellsberg and uh, Ern, um, but that is where the, the ambiguity, um, if there is any, is generated. And then once that uh, probability uh, rule or law has been um, selected, uh, we draw a profile of signal um, realizations and a profile of actions according to that law. And then uh, each player then is revealed to that player is just their element of that profile. So um, the particular signal realization to that, to that player. And then the player has a choice either to revoke the delegation or to implement it. If they implement it, and here, this is not a game tree, I'm just illustrating what it is from the perspective of each player. If they um, don't revoke the delegation unilaterally and everybody else has not um, revoked the delegation, then that action profile, which was selected by the device is implemented. If they revoke the delegation, then they independently will choose uh, potentially a randomization over their over their own actions, and then uh, the actual um, profile that's implemented is what's implemented by the device and the action chosen by that individual. And again, if they're using a mixed strategy, that will occur with probability row AI. Um, that should be a prime there. Okay. So, so that's what a ambiguous correlation device is. Um, I'll just pause for a fraction of a second if there's any questions or um, queries of clarification at this point. So Simon, I, yes. I've got a, a question for you. Yeah, please. Um, the mixed strategies here. Yes. For an ambiguity averse agent, how are we thinking about mixed strategies? Well, I, have, I haven't told you yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm, just, yeah. I'm just literally telling you how, what they can do. Um, okay. But, but this, this mixed strategy, um, I'm, I am assuming that people can do objective randomizations. Um, uh, and I don't know if this is related to the question you're, um, or you had in mind, but uh, note that um, this is, isn't going to be like a Rydell and SAS. The players themselves can't generate ambiguity. They, they, can, they can only um, choose um, objective randomizations if they want to, if they want to randomize. Okay. Yep. okay. However, I think, or, or my other answer to your question would be, ah, Evan, that's exactly what we cover in the next slide. So, so let's, uh, let's move on. So what is a delegated correlated equilibrium? So we fix our game. We have our um, potentially ambiguous correlation device. So remember, it's just the um, space of signal realizations, uh, um, of profiles of um, signals, and uh, the different potential probability diffusions under which those signals and action profiles are chosen. And we'll say that this constitutes what we call a delegated correlated equilibrium if for each player I and each of her signal realizations, she's gonna be what we call compliant. So if she complies with it, then <coughs> this notation here, QSI is just going to be for the um, uh, probability distribution Q, given her signal realization SI, this is just the marginal over the action profiles. And so this is just her expected utility for that particular Q, um, given her signal SI, her expected utility. And of course, I've said, if there is ambiguity, then she evaluates that according to the worst of those um, uh, distributions that are in that set Q, um, given that particular signal. And then, what has that got to be at least as great as so that she will comply and just not revoke the delegation? 
Um, we're going to max, we're going to, it's got to be better than any of her randomizing, um, her mixed strategies. So here she can use objective mixing if that provides a, again, hopefully this is answering more your query, um, Evan. Uh, she can use her own objective mixing um, in, in order to provide a hedge against the, the ambiguity she sees there to be. So, you know, uh, <clears throat> so whatever mixed strategy she chooses, um, she will evaluate that using the probability law out of those set of available ones, which is least favorable. And so this is just uh, the um, expected utility um, given her mixed strategy um, choice, but also with the, um, uh, the actions and um, signals, um, sorry, the, um, the actions um, given her signal, the action uh, distribution over the action profiles, which is least favorable. So as I said, if that equality holds for a particular signal, we say that player is compliant. So a correlated equilibrium is uh, the um, each um, player for each player and each of her realizations, uh, that realization is compliant. Okay, let's. So Simon, just yes. just to just to make sure that I understand. Sure. So if uh, if uh, if Q is a singleton, then we just have the course uh, correlated equilibrium of Mulan, and we that that, correct? That's, that's going to be theorem one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, and so that, that's exactly what we're going to do now. And you don't and you don't have any restriction on the set to Q, so anything can go there. Do you impose? I don't, have, I don't have anything on the restriction on the set S either. So in, uh, um, S is the, um, the signal spaces are arbitrary, and then the, the Qs are arbitrary. Except um, we, we do require it's only a finite set. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so let's um, just as um, uh, JC has intimated, let, let, to help fix our ideas and see how this all works, let's, let's just work with, first of all, consider the unambiguous case. And so in that case, capital Q is, is a singleton, so I'll just identify it by that single element. And now, um, <clears throat> that um, distribution, we can break it up into its marginal and um, well, I guess what I would like to think of is the, the likelihood of um, a particular signal profile given an action profile. So this is going to be, sigma is going to be the distribution of actions that are actually implemented because people don't care about um, signal states um, intrinsically. They're, they're only caring about uh, member payoffs that are defined on on action profiles. Compliance now um, simplifies. So on the left-hand side, we've just got you know, what is the expected utility um, from, from complying given, given your um, uh, signal realization, um, the, the prior, and this will basically be um, the uh, up updated um, posterior over the um, action profiles, um, <coughs> or equivalent to it if you do um, Bayes' rule. On the right-hand side, note that I've, I've got rid of um, the um, mixed strategies. Now, for an ambiguity-averse person, mixing over her own actions doesn't benefit her. So we just, to be compliant, it's just got to be you know, the, the best unilateral deviation, um, the best action she can unilaterally deviate from. Uh, is not better than just complying and allowing the mechanism, uh, the, um, uh, the correlating device to, to select the action profile on her and the other player's behalf. Okay, so given that inequality too, which now is simplified because there's no ambiguity, um, we, so I've just repeated the inequality here just um, for reference. So we, we, we can think of um, the simplest uh, two, canonical cases, one where each uh, actual um, signal um, space is just the space of actions. And <clears throat> the probability that the uh, action signal pro um, profile will be the action, given an action profile is just one. So we're just, each player is just told um, what action they should do. And given their information, um, they'll have about um, the, uh, sigma A, then it's essentially exactly the compliance condition for Almond's cor canonical um, correlated equilibrium. 
So now it's I'm, um, compliance to follow action AI, because um, that's the signal I got. I just look at you know, what is the, um, the conditional distribution over the action profile of all the other players given my action profile, and utility of that, sum over all the other action profiles, and that's just my expected utility for the, that canonical um, correlated equilibrium of Almond, and it's just simply saying, I don't want to unilaterally deviate to another action. So that, yeah, so to answer Jay's question, you know, um, in our unambiguous one, anything that's a correlated equilibrium uh, is um, also uh, a unambiguous delegated correlated equilibrium. And the other um, <coughs> special case is where the signal is actually um, completely uninformative or um, degenerate. And in that case, so there is only one possible um, signal profile. Um, we can just think there's one possible signal everybody sees it with probably one. So the marginal on um, given the signal is just the prior on the action profiles. And it, um, our condition two just reduces that uh, the compliance condition for Mulan and Vial. You know, you're happy to stick with the device um, choosing the action profile according to that prior distribution, um, and you don't um, know unilateral deviation by you as player I to any of your other actions um, yields you a higher expected payoff. So, very simply, we see that Nash equilibrium, was, as we um, has been well known, is a subset of correlated equilibrium, which in turn is a subset of uh, coarse correlated um, correlated equilibrium is a subset, and I've just put a star here, those um, uh, prof um, distributions over action profiles, which can be implemented as an unambiguous DCE. So we've got the inclusion one way. For our theorem, we say the inclusion actually goes the other way. If something can be implemented as a UDCE, it's also a coarse correlated um, equilibrium. And to do that, it's um, actually really just um, uh, laws of conditional probability or, or, or um, ba um, uh, Bayes', Bayes rule. So take our Q and we can always break it up as in the marginal times now <clears throat> the likelihood that you'll get um, a particular signal realization given that action profile times the conditional probability over the um, profile of signal realizations for uh, the other players, given your signal and that action profile. So with that, we can actually inequality to um, the right-hand side. Remember, it had these two sums over here. <clears throat> Since we've broken it up in, the, in this way, this only depends on S minus I. So we can take the sum inside, and if we sum over, you know, the um, conditional probability of all the signal realized profiles of signal profile, sorry, realization of signal profiles of um, everybody else except Mr. I, except given uh, conditional on I's particular realization and the action profile. If we sum over all um, S minus I, this is a probability, so it sums to one. And we can do the same for the, for the left hand side. And what do we have? we have exactly um, the um, uh, Mulan and Vial. Well, no, I haven't finished yet, sorry. So um, we have, um, <clears throat> for each particular signal realization, um, you know, this must do at least as well as what the um, player I could do by making a unilateral deviation uh, to another action um, conditional on the, um, his signal realization. Now, if we sum over all your own signal realizations, then all we've just got back is uh, the um, ex ante expected utility that you'll get from the um, mechanism choosing the action profile according to this prior distribution. 
So that's greater than, remember I've done it um, signal by signal to where you are or where player I is for each of her signal realizations, she's choosing the best um, action to deviate to. That in turn must be at least as good as if the player deviated by just choosing one action for every one of her signal realizations. But this last part here is just, you know, the Mulan Vial condition, you unilaterally um, revoke and don't allow the mechanism to choose on your behalf, you just choose on your own behalf. So if it is a UDCE star, then this inequality holds, which just says it is also a coarse correlated equilibrium. So again, you know, we, we can sort of say, okay, what we've shown is by adding um, uh, uh, generalized um, uh, measure spaces, uh, sorry, um, signal spaces or signal, signal states, uh, we don't get anything more than you get with um, Mulan and Vial. So <clears throat> let's illustrate that um, with our narrow bridge example. So what does compliance for driver one require? So if they just allow, so um, I'm gonna um, consider just uh, those distributions which put zero on um, both driving egotistically and for it to be um, compliant. So if we just allow the device to choose our action profile on our behalf, then we get six times sigma what weight it puts on DD we get two times what weight it puts on DE, and we get seven times what weight it puts on ED. If we deviate and just choose D all the time, then we'll just get uh, what weight was put here, now just gets a payoff of six, and everything else is the same. What's more interesting is the compliance for E. If we deviate to E, what we get is seven, both for the weight that the um, device puts on DD and ED. And then, but now we also have a chance of getting um, uh, EE when uh, the, the weight that it was putting previously on DE uh, now will lead to the outcome EE. So that's the, so this one holds person, the, the compliance is slack, but here there's a potential and from the symmetry, it's exactly the same. So compliance, says, and intuitively that's got to be right, the weight uh, we put on, <clears throat> the weight we put on uh, DE has to be sufficient to stop us just wanting to, um, to deviate, for driver one to deviate to E. And in particular, we must put at least um, half of what we put on DD, at least um, half of that must be put on DE and vice versa for driver two. So, since we're um, looking at a sub um, simplex for our um, four action profiles, we can draw that in a two dimensional simplex. So, the vertices corresponding to DE for sure, DE for sure, and ED for sure. Compliance for one is just saying that anything below this line is compliant for driver one. Anything below this line is compliant for driver two. And so what is compliant for both is in the gray region and the highest um, symmetric is a half a quarter quarter. Of course, at this point would be the, um, uh, <coughs> no, it's not the, the mixed strategy, but, uh, the projection at this point of the mixed strategy would be on here, but uh, let me just go on. So if we look then at the equilibrium payoffs, we're just getting what we got in the coarse correlated um, equilibrium. So everything in this gray region is possible. We'll call the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium lay above the line joining the two asymmetric uh, pure strategy equilibria, but the optimal symmetric coarse correlated equilibrium, um, which is our uh, optimal symmetric um, unambiguous delegated correlated equilibrium is that black spot. Okay, so let's see what can we do then if we allow for ambiguity 
and our players are ambiguous, ambiguous averse um, in the um, Gilboa Schmeidler sense of the multiple prior model. So for um, a signal now realization to be compliant, um, <clears throat> let me um, just introduce a bit of notation. For a particular signal now, we need to consider not just a prior distribution, uh, sorry, a posterior distribution over the action profiles, but we need to consider a set of them. For each one of these laws, the particular signal realization might lead to a different posterior distribution over action profiles. And so for our set to be compliant means that now when we um, evaluate um, uh, allowing the device to choose the action profile given our signal realization, we need to minimize over that set of um, posteriors. So TI is a posterior over the action profiles uh, that comes from one of the possible action posteriors we could have given our particular signal realization SI. And that has to now exceed what's the best that we can do from just choosing a mixed strategy, unilaterally deviating and having the device choose everybody else's action, but uh, Miss I or Mr. I choosing their action according to um, a mixed strategy, the best mixed strategy. Okay, so I'm gonna um, say for each of these set S hat, let from the right hand side, let's T lower bar I just be that posterior which is the least favorable um, from that set uh, for the, um, um, with respect to um, what the device could be implementing in terms of the action profiles. And a very straightforward result um, uh, noted in the paper is if that least favorable for that signal realization is itself unambiguously compliant, then SI is going to be compliant. If this was unambiguously compliant, um, you, couldn't, um, you couldn't do sort of better um, uh, choosing the um, randomization. And now, uh, if that's the worst, then uh, SI is going to be um, unambiguously compliant. Okay, so that's, it's going to be that insight that if something, if a po uh, posterior belief is unambiguously compliant, can we exploit the ambiguity of version of the individual uh, by using an ambiguous correlating device in order to um, approximately implement things which um, would not ordinarily be implementable. So going back to our narrow bridge example, clearly DD is not unambiguously compliant, but you know, the social planner might sort of say, when we're designing this, this mechanism, this AI um, uh, driving system, we would like them uh, as much as possible, try and sort of coordinate on um, driving defensively across, across the bridge. It gives them a pretty good payoff um, for both of them. There's not that much advantage being, being um, egotistical, but alas, we can't make it one because if it was one and the driver still has control, you know, still has a steering column and can always revoke the delegation, if they believe the other driver is going to be driving um, defensively, then they want to deviate. However, if we look at the vector, so sigma bar is just the vector one, zero, zero. So I'm now putting probability distributions as a three dimensional vector, putting zero um, and this always having zero weight on um, both driving egotistically. So if we look at sigma bar, which is just both drive defensively, one, zero, zero, <coughs> and uh, add epsilon of a half a quarter, quarter, which a, half, um, a quarter, half, sorry, a half, a quarter, quarter, which was, actually probably the way we're doing it was, um, no, sorry, it's a half, a quarter, a quarter, uh, which was the, um, uh, the maximum or the optimum symmetric, uh, unambiguously um, uh, delegated correlated equilibrium or Course correlated equilibrium. Apologies. Um, 
So sigma epsilon is one which basically is just an ep, um, epsilon um, mixture, nearly all the weight on DD, but some weight on this um, uh, randomization over action profiles, which is unambiguously compliant. So it, it's a convex combination of sigma upper bar and the symmetric coarse correlated equilibrium. Okay, so think of now of a very uh, simple um, uh, delegated correlation device. Sorry, yeah, uh, um, correlation um, uh, device. The state space just has two elements. Um, and in fact, we could do it so that each had their own um, state space and they were getting signals independently. But uh, it's, I think, this uh, clarifies and this makes it simpler. We just think they, they receive the same signal. It's one of, one of two possible realizations. And the Q has two distributions, Q hat and Q tilde. And here's Q hat. <coughs> um, has, and uh, as given here, let me go to the next slide. So, each player receives the same signal where this is. Note, if I look at the marginal distribution over actions, it's exactly sigma hat A is equal to sigma tilde A is just one minus epsilon of um, one minus epsilon of one zero zero plus epsilon of a half a quarter a quarter. So it's just sigma epsilon. So there's no ambiguity. Although there's ambiguity about the signals, or the signal realizations, there's no ambiguity ex ante about what the uh, action profile implemented will be. But if we look at the um, conditional um, or posterior beliefs over the action profiles, um, for Q hat, signal S prime, it's um, uh, conditional um, or posterior distribution over the profiles is a half, a quarter, quarter. And that's what Q tilde does for S double prime. While Q hat S double prime, which is one zero zero, uh, its marginal is just one zero zero. And that's the same as what Q tilde does at S prime. So there's a bit, as, as I said, a bit of a, a, um, a three card trick here, but you know what? We're introducing this ambiguity. Both players are getting the same signal, but because it could be drawn from two distributions, uh, you know, they both think it's possible that these are two possible marginals. <clears throat> but when they're looking at them, the marginal, which in a sense is least favorable, is that sigma, sigma star. So since we've already established that sigma star is compliant, so we've already established sigma star is compliant, when they see their signal realization and they, um, and they update um, their beliefs, updating prior by prior, uh, because it's, there's you know, two distributions they can work in with, uh, they're always, for both signal realizations, they're always um, evaluating as if it's sigma star, but that was unambiguously compliant. So uh, deviating, they have no strict incentive to deviate. Note that their interim, um, payoff, their interim expected utility, is what they get from sigma star. So um, I guess you know, I'm going to be talking um, about uh, welfare um, very shortly. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to that. So they're bearing a cost with that ambiguity, but from an ex-ambi viewpoint, you know, they're, getting, they're getting this distribution for sure from this, from this device. So what the theorem says is essentially we can do this you know, with any um, uh, CCE and any um, um, action profile whose um, utility uh, payoff uh, or payoff profile is, uh, Pareto dominates it. And so what that gives us is that uh, essentially anything in this region can be approximately in, um, implemented this way. In fact, everything apart from the dotted red line can be exactly implemented because you can always just do any, any point here can always be um, done as, as a convex combination um, 
of this point and a point on the red line. So um, anything in here can be actually exactly implemented. It's only the, the extreme points, the, the line itself, um, which the, the red dotted uh, portions, which can only be approximately implemented. Okay, I point out that in that particular example, um, compliance, compliance conditions actually do hold with equality. So we don't get strict compliance. It is actually possible for some games, um, not for all. So in the, in the paper, we, we also do point out the prisoner's dilemma, uh, cooperate, cooperate can be approximately implemented through such a device. Although note, it can only be done so um, with compliance where you're getting the same pile as if um, both players were defecting. So it's in that respect from an, an interim point of view, the player's not gonna be getting um, any free lunch. But from the ex-ante point of view and from societal point of view, we're gonna be implementing the um, cooperating in the prison's dilemma with almost probability one. Maybe that'll please the philosophers. I'll try and sell it to them on that ground. Um, however, as I said, um, we can't do that with strict, um, well, with strict compliance. But for our driving example, we can actually. Um, so we do have a, sort of a couple of minutes. So let, uh, I think it is actually worthwhile, again, just to, um, to give you ideas of actually how sort of flexible things can be because we're, we can arbitrarily um, specify um, signal spaces as we wish. Let's just specify a um, three element um, signal space for the individuals. And in the paper, you know, um, we have lemmas showing that we have quite a deal of, of flexibility so we can <coughs> have the appropriate um, likelihoods of the signals so that they induce precisely for these all three um, signal realizations, the same three sets of um, posterior um, probabilities over the action profiles. And these are, well, one is um, the, what we were previously referring to as sigma star, that one which is the best um, coarse correlated um, equilibrium. Uh, <clears throat> this one is almost DD for sure, but um, with delta on um, DE here and delta on ED for, for player two. And <clears throat> for both of them and for player uh, one, it's um, just the um, diagonal, the um, cross diagonal elements of the payoff matrix, a third, two thirds, and this one, two thirds, one third. Okay. <clears throat> what it's gonna turn out is um, if we comply, we'll evaluate our uh, interim utility according to this distribution for player one. If player one thinks of deviating, it'll actually be this one that they use. And because it's those cross diagonal ones, uh, the best they can do is actually play the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. And that's where we get strict compliance. Remember the uh, optimal symmetric course correlated equilibrium had a payoff of five and a quarter, while the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium only had a payoff of four and two thirds. So you know, we have this flexibility so we can set up with, you know, um, with more signal realizations, the possibility of one where in the interim, if you comply, you get the payoff of the course correlated, the, uh, the best symmetric course correlated equilibrium. If you don't comply, we basically go play a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. And we can sort of see that. So here are the three posterior beliefs from this, this signal. And so taking um, convex combinations for player one, we can get anything in this triangle as something that can be implemented. And for player two, it's the corresponding three points in the simplex, anything, uh, convex combinations of anything of those can be implemented with the appropriate um, uh, correlating, uh, ambiguous correlating device. So what can be implemented for both is just the intersection, this, uh, kite shaped area and as we allow delta to go to zero then this intersection and the best um, symmetric one 
approaches approaches one. So we can actually arbitrarily approach even with strict compliance. Okay. And again, you know, if you deviate, you're going to go to the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, and that has a lower payoff than the best metric course correlated equilibrium from an interim point of view. Okay, I've spent quite a bit of time uh, talking about the mechanics and how things can be um, put and not a great deal of time on, on welfare. Um, so note that the ones that I've been looking at have all been ones where there's been a common marginal distribution. So from an ex-ante viewpoint, there's nothing ambiguous about what will be implemented. And so we've just identified the welfare of a player ex-ante from their expected utility of that unambiguous um, uh, prior distribution over the action profile. But there is an interim stage after the players have observed their signals and which players will generally face ambiguity because that's how we're getting this approximate impl implementation. So you know, what's the appropriate, um, you, know, what, you might argue, why, why should we be um, looking at the ex ante? Well, there are a couple of justifications. Um, this is actually uh, as a result of a discussion between the two authors uh, or two co-authors who had different views on this. Uh, one could be um, taking sort of a Germanic Teutonic approach. I am a social planner. I'm trying to maximize my samuelson bergstrom welfare function from an ex ante viewpoint. And I don't care you know, if uh, you have to suck eggs and, um, and suffer lower interim um, expected payoffs because you're, you're, you know, uh, you're one of these crazy people who have ambiguity aversion. I'm going to exploit that ambiguity aversion to get really nice ex ante payoffs and that's all I care about. Um, you can tell by my derogatory tone that wasn't my preferred justification, but uh, my co-author came up, which I, well, um, I thought was an uh, even better one. And you could think of before you know, um, we engage in our strategic interaction, uh, <coughs> we decide you know, what's going to be the type of strategic interaction we're going to be engaged in before observing any potential signals. And so the ex ante perspective is, can be thought of as consistent planning. You know, it's well known with ambiguity aversion. You know, um, generally, there's going to be a conflict between your ex ante self and your interim self. If it's the ex ante self who gets to choose, oh, am I going to take the AI equipped car that engages in correlated play, or am I going to take the regular car and just play Nash, play you know, uh, mixed strategy Nash equilibrium? My ex ante self will say, no, I'll, I'll take. The, um, uh, the AI car. <clears throat> and in fact, you know, uh, my, interim self, my interim self is actually going to be um, better off. Uh, in this case, um, they're, they're going to have the course correlated um, equilibrium payoff. So they're better off than, we, than if I took the regular car. Uh, but when I evaluate um, uh, those, I'll evaluate from the ex ante viewpoint. And I, as I said, I'm, I am very sympathetic with that view. However, I like to have one's cake and eat it. And uh, here is an adaptation where, okay, this is, um, we'll have the device selecting which um, probability law to choose um, strategy and uh, action profiles. It will then select the strategy and action, sorry, the signal and action profiles, signal profile and action profile. <clears throat> I'm in the car. So the, uh, my car has detected another car, it's engaged, it's made its selection, and then I get an option, do I query the delegation or um, do I not? If I don't query it, the action's implemented without me ever seeing the signal. If I query the delegation, then my particular signal state is revealed to me, and then I can either revoke the delegation or, um, sorry, either revoke the delegation, choose on my own behalf, or not revoke, and it's implemented just as before. So note from this point here, you know, I understand that this was designed in a way that it is, could even be sort of um, strictly compliant, in which case I won't query the delegation, because all querying the delegation does is I get, to, I get the information about what my signal is, but that's gonna be exploited in my ambiguity version, it's just gonna cost me. So I'm just better off avoiding that and just get the ex-ante payoff by uh, avoiding information. Again, 
Something I, I think is a repeating uh, theme here uh, in ambiguity is that information can have negative value. And in this point, this is where the signal, signal states have been selected as well as the action profile. Being informed about this, <clears throat> even though there is an instrumental reason I can take with it, it actually has negative value to me. I'm better off avoiding it. Much like um, uh, your, your retirement income, you, uh, you may be better off not being told sort of which way the market is moving or how your retirement income is performing and just say, I, I know I, I'm, I'm better off just leaving it for the long, the long horizon. And that would be, as I said, having my cake and eating it. Um, I realize I, I have sort of exhausted the time um, and I'm happy I go, go through the, well, I'm not, I prefer to take questions and go through the related literature because I think we have a very nice section where you can talk about it, but, um, uh, and perhaps that might sort of come up in questions um, if people are, um, and so I've, why don't I, I, I wind it up here um, you know, within, within the, the hour and, and allow the next 15 minutes for questions or if people um, have, um, would like to see the, um, the last couple of slides on lead literature, I'm happy to go through those as well. So I'll leave it to, the, um, to Alex and, and I know JC's had to leave, so I'll leave it to Alex. So if anyone has questions, please just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Oh, okay. So there is one question that appeared in the chat. Oh, yes. Simon. Sorry. Um, I... Okay. So um, a lingering question is the following. I cannot go back in your slides, but I believe that when you presented the course correlated equilibrium, this had a singleton signal space. That's correct. That sort of means without the ambiguity, we can do everything by just adjusting the distribution of the act. Absolutely. However, in your examples with ambiguity, the use of richer state spaces appeared. Is this needed or can it be done by just adjusting the set of distribution over action profiles? I have to say that's an excellent question. Um, Jeff? Uh, no, um, we need the, the rich, richer spaces. Um, so um, I think sort of what Jeff was saying with, and, th and th this is actually a, a, a point that's, um, I'm not surprised Jeff came up with, it. this is a point that uh, Ron sort of went at great pains to point out. In the unambiguous case, essentially all we're interested in, what is your posterior belief over the set of action profiles? And so, in fact, we can identify signals with action profiles. Yeah, we can identify signals with action profiles. That's, um, but once we go to ambiguity, uh, it's no longer possible. So a note that this S hat I um, is, I'm saying the set of posteriors which are associated with a signal realization. In fact, what we're exploiting is, is that it may be the case that the different signals will have exactly the same set of posterior over the action profiles associated with it. And indeed, that exactly was the trick that I used in improving um, theorem in theorem two. So no longer can you just identify signals by um, posteriors. The signal names now actually matter because more than one signal may have um, the same set of posterior distributions over the, um, over the action profiles. So Jeff, so Jeff says privately he's got it. Um, but, uh, if it if anybody else is, is still flowering, happy, happy to follow up. All right, so if anyone has any other questions, just type or unmute and ask. I mean, if there aren't any immediate questions, maybe I can just start going through some of the related literature and that might, is that, is that fine? And, and I know that those who have to go will have gone. Yeah, um, absolutely, that, um, that, that sounds good. <laughs> so um, I have, already, have actually already mentioned um, Riddell and Sass. Um, they introduced uh, what they called Ellsberg games where they expanded strategy spaces to include not just objective randomization, but also basically 
um, ambiguity generating randomizations, and which would make generating ambiguity um, in the uh, mind of their opponents. So, you know, using Ellsberg Ern type um, mechanisms in order to um, have their uh, a player's action choice be ambiguously determined. And they, they showed that there are more things that can be perhaps sustained as a Nash equilibrium. And I, I guess at a first pass, you could sort of see ours, you know, we're doing for correlated equilibrium what they did, they did for, the, for, for Nash. Um, well, we also see that this is related to the, um, the basic information design literature. Um, and, um, you know, and I get this, this is following up on, on Jeff's um, uh, both observation and, um, and question. Um, if you remember, the, the, the huge you know, uh, literature has blossomed out of uh, Kemiko and Gensau's you know, Bayesian persuasion. There, you know, one thing which was, were, um, was so beautiful about their, their um, analytical approach was they showed that only first order beliefs were relevant for a receiver to comply. And here, at least with the unambiguous case, it's only first order beliefs that are, are, are necessary or are, are, are sufficient. Um, in a hierarchy of beliefs, it's only the first order that, that were required. So you know, we can just identify everything with just sets of distribution over action profiles. And they were, they were looking at states of the world. Um, now, uh, subsequent literature has shown with multiple receivers, uh, our designer may need to conceal a full set of infinite beliefs. And it's, you know, we still really haven't sort of tied down exactly how complicated things get when we um, allow sort of ambiguity. And I guess that's um, work that you know, um, we need to still sort of um, develop. Um, now, Ziegler eliminated relevance of higher order beliefs um, by belief free rationalize rationalizability. Um, I've misspelled that, uh, along with some further robust conditions. Which really sort of um, it's really sort of orthogonal to what we're doing. Um, now, in mechanism design literature, ambiguity has also been used to um, show how things which otherwise wouldn't be um, possible or implemented um, can be done. And I, I, I guess you know, we, we see our um, as contributing to to that literature, particularly Bose and Renault. They were showing how social choice functions not implementable with unambiguous prior beliefs might be implemented after agents beliefs manipulated using an ambiguous communication game. And you know, in a sense, that's what we're doing here is we're showing how things could be um, uh, implemented uh, as a uh, correlated equilibrium um, or a delegated correlated equilibrium by, by manipulating uh, the player's um, beliefs, even though their ex-ante beliefs about what the action profile would be is unambiguous and by itself, would not be, um, would, uh, they would not be compliant, but we introduced that ambiguity in, in order to make it compliant. And now I have run out of my slides, so I'm, I'm done. Uh, that, that's, that's perfect. Uh, let me just uh, one more time go and ask whether anyone has any remaining questions or not. Looks like there's no questions. So, uh, so not not even from my um, co-author. He hasn't objected to anything I've said. He's he's he's, he's, he's compliant. He's just sitting there. Yeah, no no good. objections. No me. objections. That's very good, Ron. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. I'd, again, um, I really.